Call the order the uh, Tuesday, January 17, 2012, meeting of the Curtin County Board of Commissioners. At 6 o'clock, we met in a work session to uh, discuss some expansion to uh, Crawford Fire Department, Volunteer Fire Department's building, and uh, had a very interesting session with them. I think I want to assure you that they are really looking after your interest. I think they did a great job with their, their planning and so on like that, and we're looking forward to see uh, some recommendations come forth from the county manager. Uh, shortly on that. Uh, Commissioner Martin's not here tonight. You may know he had a uh, medical appointment out of town. Uh, we wish him the best. And I'd like to get started with the uh, invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. We have uh, Reverend Dennis Crehan from the Jarvisburg Church of Christ. If you would rise and have the latest invocation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, come here tonight uh, in full assurance of your love and grace and your provision. Lord, we love that you're in control of this universe and that you reign and rule over the hearts of men and women who uh, just acknowledge your existence, Lord. Acknowledge your right to rule. And Lord, we want to just take that moment tonight and just give you that honor and give you that glory. And Lord, there are many concerns uh, in this building, and I pray that you will meet each and every one of them. Lord, I understand that uh, Mr. Mrs. Rohr's wife is having some medical conditions, Lord. I pray that you bless her. I pray that you bless all who would treat her and look after her and give them a peace that passes all understanding. I understand Mr. Idlett uh, lost his mother-in-law, and I pray you bless that family, dear God, that you would touch those hearts that you created in ways that only you and the Spirit can do. And, Lord, uh, uh, one of the commissioners has out tonight for a medical reason. I pray you just bless that, dear God. Lord, this country has been great because it's been blessed by you. And I pray that we will always keep you at the forefront of each and every activity. And I just praise God that this meeting tonight is starting by giving you your due. Bless all that's said tonight. Bless all that is done. We pray that it will bless the people of Currituck County. I pray that you bless our uh, increased production in jobs and increased production in the economy, Lord. And I pray through these meetings and through our commissioners that you'd bring a great blessing to Currituck County. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, the first item on the agenda tonight is uh, public comment, and I have three people signed up. Approval. Approval. I beg your pardon. I'm getting ahead of myself. It's been a long week for me. Thank you. Appreciate that. First, first item tonight is actually the approval of the agenda. Then we'll get on the public comment. And I have a couple of changes. Uh, we're going to delete item 8 for uh, consideration later. And uh, we're going to amend the agenda to add to the consent agenda to authorize the county manager to execute a deed of easement with Corolla Lake Community Association for the Wellhead Improvement Project. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Now we get on to public comment. I have three people signed up to comment, and I was interested in getting this started because I know it's going to be fascinating to hear about the Chamber Expo from Mr. Bass, who's the first one to sign up. Name and address for the record, please, okay. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Josh Bass and reside at 103 Egret Cove in Moyock, North Carolina. And I'm the president of the Curry Tuck Chamber of Commerce, and I come before you tonight to talk to you about the uh, Chamber Business Expo and Job Fair occurring on February 25th. It's a Saturday from 10 to 3 at the high school. It is free and open to the public. And um, certainly we want businesses to participate. They, uh, we like chamber members, but they do not have to be chamber members. This is a chance to showcase um, any business in the county. And then we also are asking those businesses to uh, bring job applications with them because we do have quite a few businesses here in the county hiring. Um, last year was kind of the first year we did that. It went very well. But I know uh, you all you know, probably hear more about economic difficulties then you should. Curry Tech is actually doing fairly well. There's a lot of businesses that are thriving here and a lot of businesses that are still hiring, and we're trying to get that out. And those local people that are looking for employment, we certainly would like them to come out and pick up applications. So if you can share that as you all go about the county, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. 
Second person to have signed up is uh, Mr. John Jasinski. Uh, my name is John Jasinski. I reside at 168 Young Road, Coins Out, North Carolina. And uh, I'm the commander of the American Legion Post, Incorporated, Post 288 in Coins here tonight to address the issue of an amendment to get on your next agenda, uh, Chapter 9, Article 1, Section 9-1, Paragraph D, which concerns uh, discharging of firearms uh, at a target. And I don't know if I can address anything else for that, but that's because uh, I'm not on the agenda. Okay, you just want to have us add that to the agenda for a few Yes, minutes? sir. Yes, sir. Without any objections? Um, you can ask him what that entails. Well, I thought we would discuss it at the time, so. You want to explain further what, uh, what you're doing? <coughs> they yes, probably sir. Most of us know. <coughs> Go ahead and explain for folks. Yes, time. sir. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know, but uh, Coin Jock, American Legion Coin Jock, was having a turkey shoot. Uh, in April will be 40 years. Um, the county, Kirkland County, come out with a new uh, ordinance um, through the commissioners board on April 16, 2007, that has an issue in there saying that <clears throat> we can no longer shoot a uh, discharge a uh, shotgun within 300 yards of a um, occupied resident without written permission. Um, we didn't ever have written permission. We continued shooting since 2007 to 2000, uh, December of 2011, and I got a citation on that day um, for not having written permission. So we basically gone almost five years without an issue, and now it's an issue, and it's something we have to address and uh, get cleared up so we can continue. This is affecting our livelihood at the post. Uh, it's affecting our children's youth programs and our uh, veterans programs. We have no income uh, other than our bingo and our turkey shoots at this time this time of year. So it's uh, it's affecting us pretty good. So uh, when I got the citation there, I was told I could no longer shoot if I if I continue shooting on Saturdays like we were for like I said 40 years. Uh, I'd be given another citation. So we basically we quit till we can get this uh, cleared up and maybe get an amendment to this or a different route of, of uh, conducting our business there with yeah. turkey shoots. Anybody have any further comments or questions? Please? Yes, sir. Was your citation written on a Saturday or a Sunday? It was a Sunday. Okay, but your turkey shoot is on a Saturday. Uh, Ninety percent of the time, yes, sir. We have had turkey shoots on Sundays. We have had night turkey shoots there. Over the years. Now, are you trying to just just have a turkey shoot just on Saturday from? Yes, sir. Uh, we uh, we <clears throat> understand now that uh, some people didn't like us shooting on Sunday, even though we waited for our church to get out next door and waited at two o'clock in the afternoon just to do that. But we rented it out to another facility, uh, ran our facilities to another organization to do fundraising uh, with their with their uh, company. But we normally don't do it on Sundays, but what I'm asking for now, since <clears throat> we have to have written permission, I guess we always had, nobody ever, nobody pushed the issue or addressed the issue. Uh, I actually, I've been a commander at uh, American Legion for over 10 years, and I assumed we were grandfather clause the whole time. And uh, when I say that, it didn't matter what day of the week we had our turkey shoots on, because it was never addressed on what day of the week we could shoot. Well, since this isn't an action item tonight, uh, you know, if, if we don't have any specific comments related to that, I think it's going to take some kind of public hearing and action to resolve it. So, uh, Mr. County Attorney, do you have any input on that? Yeah, this is your code of ordinances. It does not require a public hearing. Of course, you, you may always have a public hearing if you so desire on the issue or any issue. Um, it, it would require a modification, again, of, of the uh, – Ordinance that prohibits discharge of firearms at targets within 300 yards of occupied residences without the permission of the resident. Okay. Mr. Chairman, without further information, I think that this needs to be tabled until we can have a, a full discussion in, in details. Well, that's what I'm looking for is to get yes. the details. I'd like the public input on, on the information. And how would you propose we go about doing that without having a hearing on it? I think the gentleman has asked us to put this on our next agenda. Well, my question would be, does this have to go through the planning board? 
No, no. Th this Session. is not a land use ordinance. This, again, is in your code of ordinances. Do you have written language to address what he's proposed? I, I do not at this time, but I could have prepared for your next agenda if you so desire a language that would allow this organization to do what it what it is requesting. And I think publication is going to be necessary so folks know what we're yeah. have a public hearing on it and be done. Yeah, because I, I can tell you, when I was about nine years old, I used to go to those turkey shoots out there. So did and, I. And, and I'm going to have to tell you this. They were well behaved and all the alcohol and partying was done inside. Mm -hmm. That's not happening now, and that's why you're having some trouble in the community. And anything that, that I vote to approve is we got to get back to the norms of the way things were, were done. Sure. I understand. And be but a that, good neighbor. I understand what you're saying, but also I want to say this, that some of the issues are all put together with the turkey shoot. I understand. Because the other things with alcohol is when we have our membership round up and we have on-premises drinking. So everybody's trying to make this look like this all happened at the turkey shoot in the head. That's not I understand. What I, I, you know what I'm saying. Well, Will, listen, if we address that in a public hearing, everybody will get a chance to speak to that matter, and then the county attorney will have uh, some language drafted, which will give us the option of what to go for. I think what we want to do is clear up so we don't have problems in the yes, future. Sir. Absolutely. Mr. Chairman, do we have adequate time to advertise it for a public hearing? Before I yes, again, that? because because it is not a land use ordinance, there is no minimum required for the advertisement. So we certainly have plenty of time to get it into the, if, you know, three weeks into, into the, the, the newspaper prior to your, your meeting and to give adequate notice to the public. Okay. Okay. Any further comment? Okay, then without further objection, then I'll direct Mr. Uh, Scanlon to go ahead and have that added to the agenda and prepare the documentation related to that. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Jenkins. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Next person I have to speak is uh, Mr. Roundtree. <clears throat> My name is Earl Roundtree, and I'm from Gates County, North Carolina, Sunbury. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I want to make perfectly clear to every commissioner and every citizen of Curry Tuck County, I do not make a habit and will not come over to play in anybody else's sandbox. Uh, so whatever business that I will, comments that I have is not directly just to Curry Tuck County, uh, because. Uh, but I do want to say I went to Paspatank last week and picked up some good ideas from Paspatank. And on my way home, I talked to one of our commissioners and uh, come up with some ideas. And coming over here to a nice big county like Curry Tuck, I hope to pick up some good ideas. And here, I just got two comments that I wanted to make. Number one, <clears throat> today in the News and Observer, I mean not News and Observer, uh, but the Daily Advance, there was something that happened that should be on record. Uh, they had an editorial that I actually agreed with, Owen, and that has never happened before. I understand the feeling. <laughs> but uh, I did, this is uh, something that it is, I read about in Curry Tuck and I read about it, and that has to do uh, with this thing about residents. And I'm not, if from Curry Tuck, y'all fight it out. It's not my problem was going on in Curry Tuck. However, the editorial today, and I was hesitant, but it brought my attention that I was going to come because Elizabeth City has constantly had this problem. And Mr. Chairman, I don't even know you, but I read a lot about you in the last few months. Uh, but I feel like, you know, the law is not something of convenience. The law is the law. And not that we always live by it, but I guess in law school they teach you that the law is the law. And we have a law of rules. And if we're going to have law of rules, whether it's in Elizabeth City, Gates County, or Currituck, uh, then we need to, whether it's me or you, to follow that uh, rule of law. And I hope that uh, we resolve this issue about residence. Uh, if you don't live in your residence, and let me say real quickly, <clears throat> I, re I have a, count, a man who's going to run for county commission. He calls me two or three times a week. I know where he lives. He lives on his grandmother's farm. I know what district he lives in, but we've got two county commissioners up, and he don't know which one he wants to run against. And I said, oh, wait a minute here. You can't run, but for one, that's where you live. And he said, well, I think I figured out how to run in another one. Well, I don't agree with that. I do want to commend any commissioners in here that have 
stood up and says we need to because this is a state law, state thing, and it happened in Elizabeth City. The other thing I just want to say is not, is just throw this out because it come up in Paspatank. I am working hard, uh, what little bit I can do, to get voter ID in North Carolina. Now, I know for a fact that there's voter fraud in North Carolina. And I know it's a, for a fact that it is simply because there's no way to identify voters. And Pastor Tank, of course, put it on to vote as a resolution. It went three to three. The chairman's up for re-election, and he decided not to vote. It was just a resolution. But as we come down the road, I hope Curry Tuck County and the commissioners of Curry Tuck County uh, will think in the supporting uh, res uh, resolution to have voter ID. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Roundtree. And I'd just like you to know that uh, we actually already had a resolution to that effect. Thank you. I, right. That didn't make the daily advance. <laughs> well, the good things we do rarely do. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> now, we actually respect the Daily Advance. You know, that's uh, one of the newspapers our people here read, and they uh, they have a lot of fine things in there. I have to commend them that oftentimes when we do good things, they tell us about it, and, and if we don't do the right things, they certainly tell us about it. But uh, when you made your point about the law, I think we wholeheartedly agree with you. The problem we face sometimes is that the law is not clear, and oftentimes it has to be decided by a judge. And in this case, the judge, a judge has decided the law, the fact the uh, editorial editor of the Daily Advance doesn't agree with that does not necessarily make them in the right in that particular case. But thank you for your comment. Um, that's all the people I had signed up for public, public comment tonight. This is a chance for anybody that wants to address the county commissioners about any issue that you have on your mind. So if there's anybody else who would like to speak while you're here, um, just come up and make yourself known. If not, we'll go on with the business at hand. Seeing no one, great. We'll move on to uh, item three, and this is going to be my favorite one tonight. I'm sure we've got plenty of fun things, but you guys all get up and follow me down here because I'm going to drag my buddy, Mr. Past Chairman Vance Eidlett, and embarrass him. I want all y'all to stand up and clap and cheer. <laughs> Mr. Island, as you know, is the outgoing chairman of the past year and did an exemplary <coughs> job. He has been, honestly, a, a stalwart of character and the way politics should be run. I think he stood up for everything that, that I believe is right in, in what we have going on here in the county. He has never broken his word to me. He's never made a promise to me or anybody else that I know of that he didn't stand by. And it's rare to find character like that, particularly in politicians. But anyway, I just, Vance, I'm going to read what this says. It says, in recognition of O. Vance Heidelick, Jr., for serving as chairman of the Currituck County Board of Commissioners 2010-2011, and I hope you stay on this board for a long time because the county needs folks like you. I'm going to be a man of few words this evening. Uh, I would like to commend our staff. I'd like to commend our, our uh, my fellow board members, uh, I was new at this thing, and uh, in two years, I had a lot to learn, and they, they kept me moving in the right direction. I'm proud of our service. I'm proud of the citizens in Cray Tuck. I'm proud of the things that we've been able to accomplish, and I feel like I have my fingerprints on some of them. And uh, with that being said, we'll go sit down, and thank you all for your applause. Okay. All right, moving on. Another fun thing today. Item number four. Mr. Ronnie Hayes, the uh, Currituck County Athletic Director, is going to, is he here? Well, we were going to bring him up and, and recognize all the athletic teams at Currituck County High, and uh, it doesn't appear that he's here, but honestly, uh, words can't begin to express how proud all of us are of the accomplishments of our various teams. And uh, they were here at the last meeting, unfortunately, because of some unscheduled business, did not get a chance to be recognized for that. But uh, we certainly appreciate what the coaches and the athletic director does. And as I said, are just as proud as we can be of the kids because they put in a lot of effort and a lot of work with the uh, practices and the things they do. And uh, I think all of you really should, uh, you know, take pride in, in the fact that uh, such outstanding 
examples of uh, young citizens coming up are coming from Currituck County because they will certainly represent the county well in the future. Mr. Number, Chairman. Yes, sir. If I may, just for Mr. Roundtree, we adopted a resolution on November the 7th to support voter ID. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, item number five. Presentation by one of our favorite groups, Dominion Power, <laughs> on the Shawberta Idlet proposed transmission line. We'd just love to see you guys come here. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. I'm Michael Thompson with Dominion North Carolina Power, and I reside in Southern Shores, North Carolina. We want to yet again thank you for the opportunity to come before you. I'm just going to mention the team I have here with me, but that is not indicative of our presentation. It's very brief, just an update of what has happened since the last meeting on November the 7th. I have with me the project manager, Mr. Jerry Jackson. I also have Jonathan Schultes, who you're familiar with, uh, Stephanie Harrington, Bill Avery is new to our group, and we also have Bill Johnson. But the two most important people to me, other than those, are uh, the operations manager and the construction manager who put in the new lines and operate those lines once they're put in, is Mr. Lee Rozier and Mr. Steve Saunders. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Jonathan Schultes for a brief presentation. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. My name is John Schultes, and I'm here, to you to, I'm here before you tonight to talk about the Shawboat Islet 230 KV transmission line, essentially give you an update from where we were last time that we were all together. Just to briefly kind of go over some of the background on this, this picture here shows the transmission system in uh, North Carolina that we operate. As you can see, we, the uh, blue lines are the 230 kV, 230 kV lines that we operate, and the red lines are the 115 kV lines that we operate. Uh, generally, uh, coming down from Virginia, we have a 230 kV system that goes down toward the Outer Banks through Currituck County and then also toward uh, Elizabeth City and the Trowbridge and Plymouth area. Part of the reason we're building this project, as I discussed earlier, was uh, 29 29.5% growth here in Currituck County, 72nd fastest growing county in the country. There's a lot going on here. That's a good thing for you all, certainly. Uh, the other side of this, outside of um, project need, essentially, is reliability concerns. One of the main uh, regulatory bodies that we work with is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. It's the arm of the federal government that makes sure that we're operating our lines in a way that provides uh, reliable electric power. They put certain standards together that we need to work with and we need to build lines in order to meet that reliability. Essentially what we have here is the existing capacity that we have on the line through Currituck County, which you all are familiar with, is going to reach a point at which we need an additional line, the third line that we're proposing, in order to alleviate some of the load, essentially the 300 megawatt rule that we have from NERC. This here is uh, the study area that we considered for the line. It's an area of geography that I know that you all are, are very familiar with. As you can see, the, the lion's share of what we're talking about are those blue dashed lines, which indicate wetlands. And uh, for those of you that work with environmental groups or any sort of environmental regulatory issues, you can you realize that wetlands are a, a major obstacle which we have to work with. The existing line follows this blue line from the Shawboro substation to the Idolet substation. The, uh, the dog leg of the line between the Idolet substation and essentially where 158 is, is not part of uh, the line that we're upgrading. This blue line just shows the, uh, the existing line between those two points. This is the project corridor exists today. This is what we call a double circuit 230 kV H-frame structure. There's a uh, 230 kV line in three phases that goes on the top and a 230 line in three phases that goes through the bottom. Currently the existing right of way is 120 feet wide. This map here has got a bunch of lines on it, a lot of different colors, and I'll, I'll make sure I clear that up for you here. When we study a project corridor in anticipation of our application submittal to the North Carolina Public Utilities Commission, which is the state governing body and the main governing body that we have to work with when getting these lines approved, we have to choose a route and we have to defend that route. There is significant weight given from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission 
as well as uh, the state of North Carolina through general statute to site transmission lines along existing corridors to the extent possible. Additionally, in our meetings with uh, local officials here in Currituck County, the planning department also echoed that by saying if there's a transmission line in a certain area, keep the visual impacts and the disturbance in the same area. Because of those regulatory uh, guidances that we work with, and ultimately the NCUC, who looks at these guidelines and makes their decisions on routes, we tried to accommodate the transmission line along the existing corridor to the extent possible. Starting from Shawboro and going north, you see there's kind of a kind of a mess of lines around the intercoastal waterway. That was one of the first routing constraints that we saw and we looked to work with. We looked at deviating the route um, to the east uh, to go around the intercoastal waterway development. We looked at going down uh, um, 158 and ultimately we were able to come up with an engineering solution that keeps us on the existing right-of-way. Now I should mention that in order to accommodate the new line along the existing, uh, existing right-of-way down the line, we need to expand it. We need to widen it by 60 feet. When we were here before you last time, we were either looking at 60 feet to the north and the east or 60 feet to the south and the west. Ultimately, uh, the decision is to go to the north and to the east. And the eastern portion, obviously, when it parallels 158 from north to south, and the northern portion when it parallels, parallels 158 um, from east to west. In the instance of the intercoastal waterway, we found a way to make it work on the 75 feet that we have there because of the structure types that we have in place. And that is the only place that we don't need to expand the right of way because of the infrastructure that we already have in place. Furthermore, we considered not deviating from the existing right of way for two reasons. It would cause a lot of, uh, it would cause a lot of wetlands disturbance that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers would certainly not be behind. And it would parallel 158, which is something that NCDOT was not, uh, was not favorable. As you continue the line north, um, the next red line that kind of separates from the, from the blue line is the Currituck County High School. As I'm sure you all are aware, Currituck County High School's got the line going right through campus. We uh, had an opportunity to meet with uh, officials from the school district, and we had a pretty long conversation about um, their expectations for the line and, and what we were bringing to the table. It was a very productive conversation. What we ultimately walked away with is so long as we coordinate our construction schedule with them, they'll be fine with what we're putting in there. Um, there's a shed, that, a movable shed, that we'll have to move over a little bit, but outside of that, there isn't going to be any permanent disturbance keeping these structures along the expanded right-of-way. They also approached us about some of us coming to the Curta County High School and giving a little bit of a career fair, talking about what we do and how we do it and how we got to where we did. Um, you know, looking toward linemen, uh, folks like myself, uh, the project manager, and that's something that we're pretty excited about. And we're going to work with the principal of the Currituck County High School in order to provide that and kind of show some, some of those kids over there, um, you know, what uh, different types of jobs uh, happen in, a, in an energy company like Dominion Power. Going up the line further, you'll see the Currituck County Airport, and you'll see a yellow line that deviates to the south. We've come up, we've looked at trying to facilitate the airport expansion in a way that you can achieve the 50, one, 50 to 1 slope. One of the routing alternatives that we looked at was uh, bringing the line 2,500 feet off the end of the expanded runway, and that's symbolized by the yellow line. When I had an opportunity to meet with the Corps of Engineers, they saw a lot of wetlands disturbance um, off of an already existing corridor, and uh, said that that wasn't necessarily a, a preference that they would have to go with. So we are looking at, and we have um, come up with, and I'll show you a little bit further in the presentation, an opportunity, an engineering solution that when the airport expands, we can implement onto the line its existing location in order to facilitate that slope. This here is a rendering of what the right-of-way will look like, the expanded 180-foot right-of-way generally along the corridor. Um, to the right is the existing structure that we have, the double circuit H frame that I described earlier. And on the other side is a single circuit monopole structure which has uh, the three phases on staggered arms. 
These structures on average are going to be two feet different in height. Uh, the H-frame structures average about 102 feet, and the single pole monopole um, structures are going to average about 104 feet. So as far as visual impacts are concerned, it's, there, there isn't going to be a large delta between the two structure heights. At the intercoastal waterway, where I told you the structure types were different, very different, and we could facilitate using the right of way that we had. When we cross the uh, when we cross the intercoastal waterway, and for those of you that are familiar with that area, uh, we have uh, those tall single shaft monopole structures. We'll be able to place one directly adjacent to it, and that one choke point where it gets very small through there. This is uh, an engineered solution that we've come up with for the airport. Um, when you all are, are ready to make that expansion, this is something that we can evaluate, certainly. Building structures that are below the threshold um, uh, of the 50 to 1 slope. Um, and, uh, and this will help you achieve what you need in order to expand the airport. And it keeps us on the existing right of way without having to go into the wetlands and um, get the core riled up and, and other environmental groups in that direction. Essentially, just to wrap things up, the proposed route uses an existing corridor, which is consistent with North Carolina general statute. It's consistent with Federal Energy Regulatory Commission guidelines. It's consistent with the feedback that we've got from the, uh, from the local planning department. There are a couple route constraints, as I discussed. The intercoastal waterway, which we found an engineering solution that keeps us on the existing impacted alignment. Um, and the Currituck County Airport, which we believe we've come up with an engineering solution that can facilitate any airport expansion. Along this right of way, we do have several different types of land uses. There's institutional, like schools, there's uh, residential, there's commercial, um, and we've taken all of that into consideration when proposing this. We've done uh, different types of outreach. Uh, we have tried to, in order to make the most robust application that we can, We've reached out um, within Currituck County to the county manager, to uh, Chairman Idlett last year to discuss this line. We've come to the county commission. This is the second time we've been here to talk about the line and, and to uh, solicit your, your feedback and your questions and provide you with information. We had an excellent, very informative workshop with Mr. Woody, his staff, the county engineer, the, uh, the airport manager was also there, and we also had the meeting with the county schools that I referenced earlier. We also uh, went to Raleigh. We met with the NCDOT, um, and we met with the Turnpike Authority while we were there to discuss their plans and how they will affect the transmission line and future plans with regard to that. Went down to Washington, North Carolina to meet with state environmental agencies and the U.S. Com Corps of Ar US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, future meetings may go to the district office of the Army Corps of Engineers to talk about environmental permitting, and we would also like to get before the airport commission at one point here in Currituck County to discuss further our airport plans. Our community outreach, and this is one of my favorite parts to present because Dominion is very, very open and very, very transparent with the community. We have a website, www.dom.com, keyword Shawboro, where we have simulations of what the line's going to look like, an excellent project description that anybody could go and see. Um, we've sent out letters and advertisements. We had an open house in November. We have an open house that's going on right now. I think it's wrapping up that we left a little bit early to come to present to you all. We had 30 plus people in the November open house and we had about 30 people in the second open house and not all the same people. So we were able to get a, a fairly good turnout with regard to those. Uh, furthermore, there's a new position at Dominion that is called a construction communications coordinator, which is a single point of contact for those folks that live in the area that are going to be affected by construction so that they can get their concerns out and, and um, identified with the construction coordinator and construction personnel. <coughs> Our target schedule. We've been through um, you know, outreach and route analysis. Come the spring and March, we look to submit to the North Carolina Public Utilities Commission. Uh, in the fall of 2012, we're hoping that we have NCUC approval and I'll begin to secure environmental permits for this project through the Corps, CAMA, um, and CDOT, and those types of agencies. Uh, before we get, begin construction, we're going to reach out to the folks that are going to be directly affected by construction through written notification. And then ultimately, we hope to begin construction. That should say January of 2013 um, instead of January 2012. I apologize. <laughs> um, and the uh, uh, line will be in service by 2015. And with that, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, that concludes my prepared remarks. I'm available for questioning.
I have a question, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Mr. Tony? I, I believe I heard you say you, you're going to have to increase your easement, your right-of-ways, which means somebody has to give up the property for you to do that. Uh, how, what is the process that you use to, to do that? Well, um, it's, it's not so much giving up property per se because we don't acquire, we don't acquire these right-of-ways in fee. Uh, we require easement rights to it. Uh, when uh, come January of, uh, or excuse me, come the, the probably the second or third quarter after our NCUC approval, before we begin construction, we'll have our real estate folks reach out to the people that we will need to acquire um, extra right away from and there will be a bit of a negotiation process that will involve uh, appraisals, mm -hmm. and uh, we will look to get fair market value to those folks that we need to acquire easement rights from. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Biden. I have one question. <clears throat> the, the turnout of people that's been at the uh, two public comment periods, what are you, what are you hearing? Well, we're hearing a, a number of different things. We're hearing people come in and look and say, well, there's a transmission line there. You're putting another line. That's not a big deal. Um, there's some other folks that are, are, are seeing some impact of their property, and there's, there's some concern. Um, we're seeing folks um, with, uh, with just a general curiosity of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Thankfully, when we put these open houses together, we have an array of professionals there that can answer questions, anything from um, you know, what construction techniques we're going to use to forestry techniques. We have our real estate folks there, so when folks have the same question that um, – that, uh, that come about with acquiring easements and how that works. They can, they can be right there to tell them all about that, and there's a lot of questions that derive from that as well. So uh, you can't please everybody, of course, but we do our very best, and um, you know, we've gotten a very, very mixed bag of results, but I think generally a lot of curiosity. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Petrie. Uh, I have a question for you. <clears throat> with the expansion of the substation in Idlet, how much – what impact will the people that live right next to that substation, will they see any difference? Because I think I've heard people talk about there's a certain noise level that goes with a, with a substation. Uh, how, how will the people that um, I've met the people you know, that's right next door, um, uh, how, will, how will those people be impacted with the expansion? Well, if you're referring to the Idolet substation, Yes, There's sir. going to be no expansion on that leg between um, where the line deviates from Route 58 okay. and goes toward the sound. Uh, that area is not part of the project, so they're not going to see any construction. They're not going to see any expansion. Okay. Uh, at the Shawboro substation on the other end, we're lucky enough not to have any adjacent property owners, and any expansion that happens in that facility is going to happen within the confines of the existing footprint. Thank you. Yes, sir. No other questions. I had one related to the airport. Yes, sir. Talking about the uh, mandated clearance for glide slope purposes that the FAA requires for that with the existing airport and the, you know, the extension that we're putting in for the COA. What happens if we want to add another 500 feet to that runway? Well, we've already taken into consideration working with you folks on your airport expansion and looking at your master plan. Uh, we believe that the engineering solution that we've put together will help you achieve. We've worked with uh, Mr. Elliott and he sent us several plan and profiles of the, glide, the desired glide slope, and we've challenged our engineers to come up with a solution that can build structures that could meet that glide slope. Mm -hmm. uh, we're confident that with what we've proposed, that when you decide to expand that runway, um, we can come up with a solution to facilitate that. Furthermore, because of the proximity of our structures with the airport, I'm going to have to go to, uh, I'm going to have to acquire a, a Part 77 permit um, from the FAA to determine um, airport hazard structures. And uh, the, the FAA will, will say whether or not it's going to be a hazard, and if it's not, and if it is going to be a hazard, how to mitigate it. But we're confident that we're going to come in below that slope okay. um, when the airport's ready to expand. All right, I just want to make sure that we're locking ourselves in to you know, limiting the length of that runway, particularly to the south. Yes, sir. And, 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 and as I mentioned earlier, uh, an opportunity to get before the Airport Commission to talk about some of these details further would be very much desired. Chairman, yeah. can, can uh, go ahead. I just wanted to reiterate um, with the airport expansions, um, in your initial application, um, I, would, I would request that you put that modification in there. Um, I know we've spoken as far as the cost um, <clears throat> increase that could, that could happen, um, but in your initial 
application, please put those modifications in there because it's inevitable that the airport's going to expand. Yes, ma'am. Please. We had a quizzical look, Mr. Scanlon. Well, I was, I was, she might have bit on my question, but right. I'm trying to get some clarification of exactly what he's telling us he's doing at the airport. I, I heard when we were ready to expand, you will facilitate us at that time. So this um, diagram you have up here is not what you're going to do out of the ground, but when we want to expand, you're going to come back and retrofit the system to meet this. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Is that correct? Uh, right now, that right now, that's the plan. So you so this is not what you're going to do. Uh, this is this is not initially what we're going to do. But when the airport's ready to expand, this is the solution that we have in place in order to facilitate it. Can you explain why you wouldn't go ahead? I mean, there's there's going to be a cost in the future for you to come back and retrofit it. Why not install it this way from the very beginning? I'll tell you what. I will I will hand the answer yep. to that question to uh, the project <laughs> manager, uh, Mr. Jackson, and he'll be able to answer Good. that question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Chairman, Commissioners, my name is Jerry Jackson. I live at 5800 Bella Grove Court in Providence Forge, Virginia. And I want to make sure I understand your question. You're asking why we're not going with the uh, H-frame, two double H-frame. Well, let, let me ask you. Okay. In qual Historically, our, our relationship with NC Power is whenever a line has to be moved, mm -hmm. the requesting party incurs the cost to move it. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that... You're not telling us here today that, yes, you're going to accommodate us in the future at some date, but the county's going to pay to do that. If, if that's what I'm being told, number one, and mm -hmm. if it is, why can't you do this from the very beginning? You're going to incur the cost to put poles out there anyway. Why not just go with this? The arrangement that we're talking about doing it, this is just a profile of the existing right of way. If we go back with this particular arrangement, then the number of structures that are associated with this arrangement is an increase in cost of dominion. And, it, and if you want us to do that now, then it can be facilitated, but it will require the county to fund the difference delta between what we proposed originally, which was the monopole uh, configuration with the H-frame and the difference for the multiple H-frames for the low profile, recognizing that the only line that would be placed on that low profile H-frame would be the new line. The uh, existing line will remain where it's at until the county is ready to make their improvements to the airport. And that would not require any additional cost, if that's your concern. Well, I think I heard it's either pay me now or pay me later, I think. Well, I, heard. I guess that's if you want to frame it that way, that's exactly what you heard. Yeah. I have a question, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> okay, well, if we choose pay me now instead of pay me later, which is cheaper? Well, obviously, there's a time value of money. Uh, we can give you a cost now, and obviously that'll be what it is. Uh, depending on how long you delay, that cost could go up. Or it could go down. It depends. How long we delay what? <clears throat> Authorizing us to relocate and re reconfigure this line at your expense. So you don't know how much it's going to cost, but you know no, it's going to cost more. We know it's going to cost more because right now at the present time we have three structures that are in the cone that's influenced by that glide path, and we're planning on putting in three monopole structures. All right, this particular arrangement here is going to call for from six to seven structures times three which is 21 structures okay so when you look at just the numbers alone it tells you it's going to cost more plus the expansion of the right-of-way is going to be greater on that piece of property because of the spacing of those three circuits that are presently are going to be installed there and i thought this meeting was going so well <laughs> I did too, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. I have another question. I appreciate that. Believe Can me. I ask a question? How long would you, how long would it take you to determine A or B? I don't like B. What respect? I mean, you talking uh, about cost? the difference in cost? I mean, oh, it's we like, can put together a cost estimate for you. That's not a problem. How long but would it take you to do that? What we need, what we need, I, we received a letter asking us to consider. And it was pretty, the letter wasn't very definitive as exactly what they wanted us to do. It said just consider the expansion, which we have done. We've looked at it from an engineering perspective and from a construction perspective, and we have a game plan in place. But have we actually sat down and engineered this, this option and come up with a formal cost to present to the county? Not at this time. But it doesn't say that we can't do that. We would like for you to do that. Okay. I, I would not like for you to do that. I think that y'all should bear this cost as you go forward. Well... That's I mean, up for discussion, but I, I, you know, based in, what's that? 
Commissioner Scanlon? I, I am not a commissioner. <laughs> oh, well, county manager. I'm, I'm county the, manager. I'm the county but, manager. Oh, you don't want sir, that sir, he writes the checks. Okay, he writes the checks. Uh, as he said, when any time that an outside entity asks us to relocate their facilities, uh, it is on that individual, especially if it's protected by an easement, that uh, relocation cost is borne by the requester. Have you have you received your permits to go forward yet? No. Have not submitted to the NCUC. I think there, we need to go on record uh, asking them to approve this with the modification. I have an addition to that I would like to suggest, too, which was not addressed, which I asked for specifically. Okay. My concern is the definition of a power grid is multiple feeds mm -hmm. to substations. Right. If you run all of your lines in a single right-of-way, a single natural calamity can take them all out. There is right. no grid. You just got right. a single feed. Right. Uh, we've had occurrence of tornadoes, which don't happen in current, you know, regularly around here. But, you know, if it's touched down in one spot and go through there, one well-placed tornado could take the whole feed out to the idle substructure or substation. As could a hurricane. Yeah, absolutely yeah. correct. As could a hurricane, yeah. Hmm. Why don't we have a grid? Why don't you run lands, lines coming in from different directions so that if one feed goes out, at least we've got some backup power coming from another direction? You, that is a planning question, and, and Larry called our planning. Honey, yeah. Um, <laughs> is he with us? He's not. Okay. But uh, that is, that's a valid question. And right now, the load on the outer banks doesn't warrant looping or networking, as you're talking about. But we do have facilities that go down through Trow Bridge, and they are looking at, looking at in the future of networking, as you say, to bring it back up from the south, because at the present time, everything – is radial coming from Currituck County and heading south to the Oregon Inlet and then heading north to Corral. So your point is well taken and we are looking at it. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Chairman, I have a question. I, and just, just to add on that real quickly, uh, as far as routing lines are concerned with the way uh, the North Carolina Public Utilities Commission is, uh, with the guidelines that we get from the federal government as well as environmental agencies, uh, those guidelines push us toward utilizing existing electric corridors as much as we can. Um, here in Currituck County, as far as getting load between the Shawborough substation and uh, down to the Idolet substation, there aren't too many options that we have in order to facilitate that without clearing uh, a lot of wetlands, which is, is not something that the environmental, ag environmental agencies look favorably upon. And also, a lot of this is protected wildlife area as well. Those constraints that we work with uh, ultimately guide us in the direction that we do to try to facilitate using this right away. Ultimately, when we get to the North Carolina Public Utilities Commission, we submit them what we believe is the appropriate route for this um, and the reasons why using the guidelines that we have in place. And the NCUC makes the final determination on the route with what we have. Uh, we, you know, we feel that if we were to deviate too much from the existing corridor, they would come back and say, "Why couldn't you make the existing corridor work?" And that would ultimately be the direction that they point us, because of guide, like I said before, because of guidelines from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, North Carolina General Statute, and environmental agencies as well. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> go ahead, man. Just a comment. I, I did sit in on one meeting, mm -hmm. Mr. Scanlon and myself, the airport. Uh, construction and and upgrading and all it was it talked about extensively. Uh, I was informed at that point in time, uh, or maybe I just misunderstood, but my recollection of the conversation was, well, now is the time to put all these extra things in or or <clears throat> reroute the the power grid, so to speak, up front, and that they certainly would. Uh, not be hesitant in doing that. To my knowledge, there was not any mention of any money to the county. I mean, Mr. Scanlon, is that your recollection? Uh, it is. So, with that being said, that was that was the discussions that I had, <clears throat> and I think Mr. Scanlon just <coughs> confirmed that uh, same thing. So. I too was in that meeting, and I think we were talking about it from a logistics standpoint. That if we were going to do something with that line, the fact that we were taking that line out to rebuild it for this project because of operational issues and the fact that it's radial to the Outer Banks, that this would be a good time. We did not get into finances. Uh, there was some discussion outside of the meeting that it would be a uh, financial impact on the county. And it was even discussed in the first open house, I believe, uh, Chairman, Vice Chairman Gilbert, you were there, and we discussed that. She even mentioned it and uh, referenced that in her comments earlier. 
So I, I don't think we misled. Like I said, I was speaking strictly from a logistical standpoint because, again, because this line is radial and it feeds the outer banks, and I have to take this line out of service in order to do what I have to do. Uh, if we're going to do it, we'd like to do it once and be done with it. But, um, again, uh, if, if the county is ready to pursue now and they're willing to fund their portion of what, what, what would be the relocation or the rearrangement of that line, Dominion is not opposed to it. Now, we do have certain time constraints. This project is supposed to be in service by May of 2015, so that decision would have to be made fairly quickly so that we could get ourselves in a position as we start our engineering process to make sure that we have everything engineered and the material ordered. Uh, these would probably be special ordered backbones, or excuse me, uh, structures, and as a result of that, we would need to go ahead and get those ordered early. The lead time on this, uh, these structures can be up to 12 to 14 months, depending on the number and the, uh, the quantity of them. So, Chairman, I have refrained from asking any questions to yes, yet because two-thirds of the structures you're talking about going to 21 is on my family's property. I'm aware of that. So I have to ask these questions. How tall is that tower? That Which one? The modified height tower. Um, the modified height on that tower, I am not 100% sure. Do you remember what, Rob? 59. 59 feet. So the wires will be hanging about 40 feet? Uh, it is designed for 25 feet at the middle of the sag, between spans, at the bottom of the sag. Has there been any studies done on the electromagnetic field effect on crops? On crops? With that much power going through uh, there? No, I, I, I'm not aware of it, but we do have a gentleman in the audience, uh, Bill Avery, who is uh, with our transmission <coughs> engineering group that can address any EMF questions. I'm just questions curious. Because you, uh, you read I'm not these aware things of it, Bill, in here. Can you speak to that as far as the Im impact on crops? No, no, oh. no studies that I know of don't, you know, any effects. And one thing we did take into consideration when we built this line or when we looked at this arrangement, um, being from this area or having lived in this area for 25 years, I'm pretty much familiar with farming equipment. And one of the things I was concerned about was the clearance like on um, uh, combines for cotton, for harvest well. of cotton. They're well over 17 feet tall. And because this line was divide, uh, what we call a tangent line, uh, the sag is at 25 feet mid-span. And I've gone back and talked to engineering, and what we're going to do is go with what we call a double dead end arrangement, which will draw the wire up and probably gain us another three to four foot of clearance. So there was some thought put into this as it applies to the, your agricultural activities on the property. Because, <clears throat> you know, it, it is my family's land that's going to be affected by yes, sir. this. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one additional question. Um, you've got two structures that are being modified in this plan, the one at the airport and then the one over the intercoastal waterway. Um, is there a cost difference in the intercoastal waterway and are you all bearing the, the we're not, expense We're not of that? modifying anything at the intercoastal waterway. We're just adding two structures. Okay, so there's not a modification in that line? Actually, okay. the structure we're adding is the same structure that we would be putting in here at the airport if we weren't having to deal with the airport issue. Okay, so it would be no additional cost? For the intercoastal? Mm -hmm. No, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I want to go back to what Commissioner O'Neill said. <clears throat> I totally agree. Um, to me, this, with knowing that the airport is there, this should have been uh, part of the pre-planning that you take into consideration the modifications. You've got to do whatever it is you've got to do so the county is not bearing the cost. I would have thought that if this is an airport, you should have pre-planned that. My next question is, what I'd like to know what our options are as far as I don't agree we should be picking up the tab, not if you're building this. And I think, trust me if I'm right, uh, I think we're get, fixing to get a rate increase. I think there's been some discussion Okay, about so that. we're getting a rate increase. You're building it through here, and we've got to pick up the cost of this. I totally, I, well, I don't agree with that. So let, me, let me back up. You're not picking up all the cost. Well, I know. I think what you told uh, Manager Scanlon that, Whatever changes we make, the county is going to pay it. And his words were, pay me now, pay me later. That's like A or B. I don't like B. I don't like A. And, and, I, and I can totally understand that. But Especially if you're going to give us a rate increase. Well, the way the business is conducted, any time that we pre-exist on an easement that we've acquired from the property owners and a third-party entity come in and wants that facility moved, then because that third-party entity is driving that relocation, that cost is borne by them. I know, but I would have thought you would have planned ahead if there's an airport. 
if, uh, if I'm missing something. To be honest with you, we weren't aware of the airport expansion probably, what, three or four months ago? Just prior, we were just prior to the meeting that we had. And um, from an engineering standpoint, we hadn't even had a chance to look at it because yeah. we were not aware of the, and I have a question for the chairman. You said additional 500, we were told 1,000. I, I thought we were going to have 500 foot it, sometime in the future and relocate. Is that on top of the 1,000 or is that just 1,000? I believe the 1,000 is the total. In the, in the, in okay, the so you are looking at a 1,000 foot extension to the south. I think we're, we want to preserve the right to be able to do that, yes. Right. Well, see, and, that, and that's fine. But see, that, that's my point. Uh, reserving the right and having that, that expense be borne by the ratepayers in the state of North Carolina or for Dominion, because it's going to be passed on to the ratepayers one way or the other. You just did that. Uh, we did it for previous, not well, for what's I going think, forward. Yeah, I think what we're driving at really is that if you have one line that's in the way now, we'd rather you move it and right. build all the lines out of our way rather than put another one in the way and have us make pay for moving two in the future. Mr. Chairman, Michael Thompson again. If it would be uh, in the interest of the county to come up with uh, their definitive plans on length of uh, expansion at the airport and give that to us and us to come up with a cost, recognizing that you don't like A or B, we understand that, and presenting that to you and coming up with some discussion at that time. That sounds reasonable to me. I'd like to know what it's going to cost and allow for it. I'm going to move. Okay. We do that, okay. and we move forward with this meeting. All right. We okay. beat this horse. To I death. have one other suggestion I'd like to add. I think we need to have the county attorney contact the Utilities Commission and find out what our rights are about intervening with this application to make sure our taxpayers are protected from a future cost increase. I mean... Your ratepayers and our taxpayers are the same people, and and so I I think that uh, we need our county attorney to investigate what our options are with with this, and what our rights are. If the board will concur with that, I'll second, I'll second that. Then we can move on. And then you can thank do what you. you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. We'll do that, and I'll be in contact with Dan when we get that accomplished. Do we thank understand the time. motion? Do we need to restate that in its entirety? We have a motion to <coughs> take that as a friendly amendment, make okay. it all one motion. All right. We have, then we have a, an amended motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Chairman. Pleasure seeing you again. <coughs> Safe trip home, everyone. Thank you. I know. <laughs> all right. Moving on to item six. We go, we'll, we'll try to uh, handle the items expeditiously. Uh, public hearing in action. This is a carryover from the last meeting. PB 11-19, Sean Moore, request for a zoning map amendment to rezone 20.12 acres from agricultural A to conditional district residential CD-R on property located in Moyaka, determinants of Thane Drive, tax map 22, parcel 63R and 63S, Moyak Township. And we have all the parties here. Mr. Uh, Woody, would you like to reiterate? Uh, I would, real okay. briefly. Um, this was tabled from the last meeting. Staff was asked to meet with the uh, applicant and one of the nearby citizens, Mr. Smith, to discuss uh, stormwater and drainage issues on this property. I'm going to recount the meeting very quickly and read into the record the zoning conditions that uh, staff and the applicant uh, agreed to recommend to the Board of Commissioners for your consideration. Meeting was on January 12th um, between staff, the applicant, Mr. Smith. We reviewed the UDO requirements discussed that design work and stormwater calculations are typically completed with the preliminary plat. There is another public hearing step with this subdivision, so you will see it again. Um, we reviewed runoff coefficients, which helps uh, to hopefully articulate how, how the stormwater is uh, calculated. Uh, we discussed locations of major drainage features. We all recognize this is a low spot near here, so water, water runs to the low spots. We've, we've got issues with that. Probably the one thing I'll, I'll say, and I need to say this, the best way to deal with some of the watershed issues, or excuse me, some of the flooding and drainage issues in Moyoc is really to deal with those issues more holistically, possibly through the means of some sort of service district. So I'll say this one subdivision is not going to fix the drainage in this area of the county. It's, it's going to take a, a more holistic approach to do that. Um, what we did do with this one particular subdivision is come up with some zoning conditions that I think address some of the concerns. 
and I'm going to read those into the record, and hopefully the board will include uh, this into your motion. Uh, zoning condition number one, a drainage analysis of the development site will be provided to the county at the time of preliminary plat submittal. The drainage analysis will investigate methods in which the site's stormwater design will reduce the discharge from the site during peak storm events. Design features are things that this, this analysis will include are the use of lot lines, swales, or ditches, or ponds to capture stormwater leaving the lots and provide additional storage. Diversion of some stormwater to the ditch along the western property line so we don't overrun the ditch on the eastern property line. Uh, and techniques to control and reduce the velocity of the discharge. That's to slow down the water that comes off this site. Uh, and finally, we wanted to add a condition that open space may be relocated within the development for purposes of stormwater management. I've put at your, your place a memo from uh, Mr. Eddie Hyman of Hyman and Roby that goes through some of the calculations that he has tentatively done um, to help deal with the stormwater issues from this site. I'll let Mr. Hyman explain that to you if, if he'd like to. Um, from, ta from staff's perspective, I think we had a successful meeting and came up with a reasonable way to move forward at the rezoning stage. And of course, you'll see this again uh, with the preliminary plat. So with that, we, we still recommend approval of this request. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Question, Mr. Woody. Right. Mr. Doxy, he's been he's he's been in this process all along. He, he was. It was Mr. Doxy and uh, Michelle Perry from the engineering staff. Thank you. Other questions, Mr. Woody. Mr. Hyman, you want to address this? As Mr. Woody said, the meeting went well with the owner, the and the staff. Uh, we came up to the additions to the conditional rezoning uh, that include the drainage swales and the, the uh, and measures to slow down the water coming off the property. <clears throat> what I provided for you is a stormwater runoff prediction calculation for a 20 acre site, which is what we have. When you're converting it from farmland that generates a high runoff value because you, you try to get the water off the crops as quick as you can when you get a rainfall or a storm event. It, being converted to a residential subdivision, low density residential subdivision. And this, this is a standard math method, it's called rational method for calculating or predicting water runoff in any given storm event. It's, it's, this method is used, TR55 is another program we use that also evaluates pre and post conditions that we punch into a program and it generates how many cubic feet per second we'll be getting off of a site in any given storm. We use this data to size our pipes, to size our swales, to calculate velocities because as you know how many cubic feet are coming off, you can then calculate velocity. What we plan to do, and this it proves that the runoff coefficient coming off of cropland has a value. And then when you, you mesh the converted values from open space grass areas, open space reforested, open space, uh, I mean, uh, lawns and yards, rooftops, pavement, and other impervious areas, when you crunch those numbers back in, you see the difference in the runoff values. Now, this, the pre and post calculations are on your form or on the tabulations we've provided. Uh, and it, it shows this model, the other models also prove that on a low density development like this, you're generating less cubic feet per second in, a, in any given storm. The storm that I have done here is a 10 year storm, which we always use as our, as a kind of a rule to calculate from. But the, uh, like I said, all the models and all the programs agree that there is a reduction from open fair cropland to low density development where you have grass, uh, well manicured lawns and things of that nature. Even though you do add impervious area, the offset is you don't increase the amount of flow. But we've also agreed in this in our in our meeting and when we design some of our swales, we'll put them on a flat grade, which will make them hold water longer. They'll mit mitigate out slower as we make do our development design. And, uh, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have about what I provided as a runoff calculation. And, uh, and again, remember that as we move forward with our design, the watershed areas will be broken down into smaller areas, and each one will be calculated at a discharge point, and the water will be you know, handled at that time. So 
that's how we the process will move forward. So I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Question, Mr. Hyman. Uh, Mr. Hyman, does this new design of the lots interfere with any of the original drainage patterns that exist on the current land? At this point, all the all the ditches drain from west to east. They don't. Um, and they drain towards Mr. Smith's property. They all are ditched that way. There's no connection to the ditch on the west side of this property. What we had talked about, uh, Mr. Smith farms that land. We had talked about connecting a few, and let me back up. The ditch on the west side drains straight, as it comes down that property between these two properties, crosses under Guinea Road as soon as it hits Guinea Road. The ditch on the east side drains down, runs through Mr. Smith's property, and then under Guinea Road through a damaged culvert. We had talked about diverting some of the water to the to the west or reconnecting those ditches as we change our, uh, which we have to be cautious if we divert any water in any drainage situation. We're cautious to do that. What that would do is get water under Guinea Road before it went through Mr. Smith's property. And it, if we can evaluate the impact that could be an option and that would get water under guinea road and on over to rolling creek before it even goes to mr smith's property and since we have a road coming up through the center we could possibly divert as much as half of the water coming off the property now away from mr smith and under uh, guinea road um, but like i said we have to be real cautious about doing that and i'm um, staying um when you're talking about like the flat swales, are you also talking about possibility of undersizing an uh, outlet structure? Or... Yes. Okay. And that will be addressed when you come back for That's right. special <coughs> use permits. When we get into our design. Any further questions, Mr. Hammond? Mr. Hammond, when you put the when you put the water on Guinea Road, <clears throat> does that affect any of the other properties on the other side of Guinea Road? On the other side of Guinea Road. No, I mean, if if you're diverting the water there, well, it can it can it possibly create a problem for other property owners? The water is going to the lowest point. Uh, will it cause a, a more of a problem? I would say no, because we're our overall discharge is going to be less after the development is built out than it is than than you're getting off of it now. And this is what you need to realize when you compare the precondition and postcondition. You have an X number amount of cubic feet coming off of a piece of property as it exists. After we're done, you'll have less than that, that amount coming off, so the impact to the watershed as a whole will be less. Um, this property lies in a large watershed. I can't even, several square miles, I'm not, probably 10 or 15 or 20 square miles come down to Rolling Creek, actually probably larger than that. And I think, um, from Moyoc all the way around anyway. This property, the low point is where we're talking about. So the impacts that we're gonna have from this development will not increase the problem. We've talked, like I say, Mike Doxy was in on it. He's talking about talking to DOT. We've got damaged culverts that slow the water down from getting off, causing some <coughs> drainage problems. Maintenance is a bigger problem to the to the neighbors here than uh, the impacts from this development will cause. Um, but to ask your answer your question by diverting that water over, it's not the people that live on the other side. There's a once it hits Rolling Creek, I've heard you can get a boat most of the way up it. So once it's there, it's to the outlet and it's it's gone. Now if you have a wind tide affecting the headwaters or the tailwaters, you'll, it's going to be a different event. But uh, and, and that would not even be a rainfall event anyway if you have a wind tide coming in. That's just a, a wind flow. I just want to make sure the people, your neighbors, aren't affected well, in a we're, negative way. Like I said, there's water coming off of it now in a storm. Okay. That's Once right. it's developed and designed, we, the impact will be less. I understand. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm missing something. I mean... All right, if it rains, it rains. Yes, sir. The footprint of the property is the same. Mm -hmm. I don't care if there's houses on it, if it's open space or whatever. The volume of water is going to be the same. I mean, is that not true? Well, the volume, the infiltration, you, you, the, 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 what happens in a rainfall event? 
the, and the C number that you have in this equation is the uh, runoff coefficient. And that's how fast water moves across a surface. I understand that. If you slow the water down on a surface, it has more time to infiltrate down, so you get okay. absorption. Okay. So the, the generated cubic feet per second has longer to absorb as it's running off of a property slower. And that's so the impact that if it was if it was a piece of glass and you dump water on it, yes, the amount's gonna be the same no matter what you do on top of that piece of glass. But when you change the the I'm speed trying to disagree the, with you, I just didn't understand. Well I'm trying yes sir. Uh, that's I'll be glad to try to explain it. Any other questions? Mr. Hyman? Okay, uh, Mr. Smith, did you want to make a comment? Are you uh, satisfied with the situation? I'm pretty satisfied. Uh, I think we had a very productive meeting, uh, and I'd like to thank the commissioners and the county staff and Mr. Moore's people uh, trying to work with me. Uh, Mr. Petrie raised a question a while ago about if we divert water, if they divert the water to the west ditch. That's not going to impact the people on the other side of Guinea Road. Uh, the, the parcel here, originally when it was farmland, there was three, the first three or four ditches drained into that west ditch to start with. And uh, when the first houses were put in on the road and, and all some of the, the original, first original ditch got covered up and it was moved. And now that it still does, and some of the others where the house next house is sitting is uh, cov it's covered up. It, it doesn't. I don't. Bl I believe the first one is the only one now that is draining in there. Uh, but it was before a good part of that pr parcel of land did drain. <coughs> excuse me, into the western ditch, which is uh, I'm gonna say it's about six foot deep. And today the water was probably, with a south wind, probably 12 inches. It may be two foot now with a, with a south wind. But uh, it's, it's a ditch capable of carrying quite a bit of water. Uh, the ditch that next to on my property, that is the majority of this uh, piece of land is draining in now. Uh, the water level is up to the top of the day. I mean, it's foot to two foot above sea level. So, the, you know, talking about the water levels at the top of the ditch. Now, uh, I think it's going to be a lot better for for me, for the folks that live in this development, to uh, divert it over into that bigger ditch. Uh, it's not going to make my problem go away, but I don't think it's going to make it a whole lot worse if, if they do. I just don't want to move your problem to somebody else's problem. Right. Um, I mean, do, do like uh, we discussed the other day, putting in wider swells and uh, structures to slow the water down coming out of those ditches. Uh, I don't think it's going to make my problem a whole lot worse than it is. It, it, it's not going to, you know, like Mr. Woody talked about, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to need to address that problem on a bit larger scale in the future. And uh, I think that's about it. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Close public hearing then. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we approve um, PB 11-17 with the added zoning conditions due to its consistency with the 2006 land use plan and that the request is reasonable and in the public interest and promotes orderly growth and development. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Etheridge. I would suggest, and if the board will go ahead and direct the staff to begin planning for a Rolling Creek drainage district to address these other concerns. Um, it is a large, expansive drainage basin, and we need to start getting a handle on it because it, it not only includes this property, but it will goes up into Eagle Creek and some of those properties. So I think it's time to begin the process on looking at that. Any comments or questions about that? Well, that what, what you're suggesting, will that address the culverts 
that are in They're disrepair. They're going to address that now. No, I'm talking about the other culverts that are there that are in disrepair. I think that the NCDOT are responsible for is what you're doing. Will that address that? It's just like any other drainage district. There will <clears> be assessments made of issues, and then as the money comes available through the district, they'll be addressed. I just want to make sure that was included. In, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, okay. anything that's in that drainage district. I'm a new commissioner, and I'm going to use it. And what kind of taxes are it going to take to change the sea level at this particular site? <laughs> Pump it in the air. Oh, okay. Evaporate. Well, without any objection from the board, I'll uh, direct Mr. Scanlon to look into that. Yes, sir. Procedure. Thank you. Item 7, Public Hearing and Action, PB 10-04, Outer Banks, Harley-Davidson, request for a new special use permit for special events, located 8739 Kirtok Highway, tax map 131, parcel 88, Poplar Branch Township. All the parties that intend to speak to this issue, please come forward and be sworn in. It's a special use permit. Does anybody else intend to speak to this? All right. Left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, hold truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Okay. I'd like to remind everybody that the testimony offered has to be of a nature that uh, information you're expert in. We don't accept opinions or uh, petitions or representations of anyone who is not here to be cross-examined on that. Mr. Woody, I'd open the public hearing. You go ahead with your presentation, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be relatively brief. This is our annual renewal meeting for the special use permit. Uh, we did a little research and, and come to find out we've been issuing SUPs for this property since 2004. So we've been doing this for a while. Um, generally, uh, this event, which is, is twice a year, it's, it's for bike week, a, a spring and a fall bike week. And it generates activities, and they have uh, vendors on the site, uh, activities, various things that attract people to the Outer Banks Harley-Davidson property. Um, generally, we, we've done this, and I've looked through some old permits, and we've had occasionally we have some, some concerns with parking on a mobile, mobile road and church road. But generally, this event goes off pretty well. Um, I do think that the, the Harley-Davidson staff makes an effort to try, try to conduct a safe meeting or a safe event and uh, uh, without any incident. Um, so what staff is doing this time is we, we are going to recommend approval again of the use permit for bike week, but one, with one modification, um, rather than have the, the use permit come back once a year, we'd, we'd like to suggest that we add a condition that says that each separate event is coordinated with county staff and state agencies um, to make sure that, that things such as parking and public safety and, and, and food service are addressed. And that we'll, we'll coordinate, staff will coordinate with the Outer Banks, Harley-Davidson folks for each event. And until such time as we have an issue or there's a, a cause to initiate a revocation of the permit, um, we'll just progress under those terms of the permit. And if something does come up or something is not coordinated properly, then we can bring it back to you for reconsideration or for revocation. So that would be staff's recommendation on how to move this forward. Um, rather than have this annual renewal every year. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Questions for Mr. Woody? Hearing none, would the applicant like to speak? Name and address for the record. Please. Certainly. Uh, Kevin Johnson, I reside in Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, as Mr. Woody said, this is our 10th year doing Outer Banks Bike Week, our 7th uh, year here in Currituck County. And uh, I think we've done a good job of working with the county and all the different uh, services involved to make sure that we do our best to uh, least impact the, the county, parking, highways, and everything else. So uh, most of the uh, commissioners uh, have been around and seen this uh, event go off and uh, know that we are quick to respond to any issues that are brought up. And we just uh, look forward to doing it in the years to come and getting a little bit bigger and bringing a little bit more money into this county. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chairman, what assurances can you give us that <clears throat> your security, uh, you hire um, Currituck County deputies? Because I think you've had some security people there that weren't um, deputies. I think maybe they work for a security firm. Is there any assurances that you can give us um, that, you did, that you're going to hire some? Your first choice is Currituck County um, deputies off duty and give them an opportunity to make some money. The only assurance I can give you is it's already been requested from the sheriff's office. It goes in as part of our permit. Uh, the only time we've ever had other than sheriff's deputies security is simply overnight when there's nobody there uh, watching assets that belong to the dealership. Uh, when there are people on site, it's always a sheriff's deputy. Uh, I saw some other people that weren't sheriff's deputies. That's why I'm asking for assurances. 
they weren't hired by <coughs> us. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Any other questions? All right, hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. What's the pleasure of the board on this matter? Move for approval with the staff's findings of fact and recommendations being part of the approval. Second. Have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Next item uh, is number nine. We delete it number eight. Appointment to the Recreation Board. I have an appointment on that for, from District 2. Uh, Ms. Everhart had resigned. Um, I'm going to uh, nominate Mr. Neil Smith, who I think was recommended by Jason Weeks for the position. I have one, District 4. Okay. Uh, Janet Williams Rose. All right. Those are all the positions I think we have open. Oh, there was three. One or three? That's, that, that, that's, 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 yeah. that's the two. Yeah, Ms. Okay. Ms. Hampton actually was carried over. Okay. Those nominations, I have a second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Appointment to the Economic Development Board. And then we have uh, Mr. Petrie. Um. I'd like to pass along to the next meeting if I could. All right, we'll defer that. Point me to the Board of Adjustment. Mr. Chairman, in uh, Commissioner Martin's absence, he's asked me to put forward the name of Mills Riddick as his appointment to the Board of Adjustments, and I would like to place forward as my appointment Ms. Vivian Simpson to the Board of Adjustments. All right, we have two nominations. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Curious. Appointment EMS Operational Medical Director. <clears throat> and we have a recommendation, I think, from Chief Glover for that. He's recommended uh, Dr. Samantha Furia. Excuse me. Yeah. Move for approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Appointment to fire an EMS advisory board. Who's this at? That is uh, Northern. It's oh, that would be Miss um, Gilbert. That would be one of the large. It, it actually yeah. is. is yeah. Yeah. On the board, the volunteer fire departments actually have some recommendations, and this is actually coming to toward for you, but it's the Northern District recommendation for the volunteer fire department, and you have a letter. Uh, in your agenda package of who they're recommending. Okay. I move that we uh, accept the nominations as presented. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Word bid for Wellhead Subdivision Drainage Improvements, Project Phase 2. Mr. Scanlon. Mr. Chairman, this is bringing forward Phase 2 to you for the Wellhead uh, Subdivision Stormwater uh, Drainage Project. Uh, this is funded by monies that uh, we borrow. Uh, the district tax pays back this project, so if you're not a, uh, a property owner or resident in Wellhead, uh, you certainly do not pay anything towards the, uh, or contribute anything towards the, uh, the debt. Uh, phase two is installing on Barracuda the, the same kind of infrastructure that has been installed on the other two streets, uh, a stormwater uh, uh, groundwater lowering device. Uh, we're also going to go on to Dolphin Street and use a, a modified, a, a bit smaller kind of a system to try to encourage some uh, positive drainage in that area. Uh, the project did go out for bids. Uh, rec staff recommendation is for the lower bidder, bidder which is George Raper and Son, uh, and the, the contract price of one million one eighty three six eighty three fifty five. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions, Mr. Kennedy. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Carries. Consent agenda. We had one amendment to that. I'm sure, Move everybody remembers. Approval. Mr. Chairman, before we Thank move forward on that, on the last next to last page of that easement. It says, witness my hand and official seal this 13th day of January 2011, when in fact that probably should read 2012. That, that's not sub substantive. We can fix that. Okay. I just wanted to point that out. Good. Yes, pretty good. Yeah, I see you right okay. there. So do we have a motion to approve? I thought there was a motion and a second. Motion a second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Commissioner's report, Mr. Etheridge. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't have anything to report tonight. Mr. O'Neill. 
Mr. Chairman, I don't have anything to report, but I have a request. I have, uh, over the years, attended a lot of different meetings in a lot of county buildings. I've attended them in the libraries and different areas. In some of our meeting buildings, we do not have a United States of America flag, nor a North Carolina flag. A prime example is the library in Barco. And it, I've been in meetings where people would bring a little flag in on a... You know, a pencil. Yeah, different things. And, and I would like to request that the county make sure that every meeting room that we have, there's a United States flag and a North Carolina flag, even if it's, you know, against, well, it would have to be against the wall. But most of the meetings, people do want to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And unless they bring a flag, it's, it's, they're not been able to. So I'd like to ask the board to request us to make sure every meeting room and this county has a United States flag. I'd, I'd like to add just to that, take it one step further, that all of our public safety buildings has the same same thing, our fire departments and that type of stuff. Yeah, anywhere that the public can meet, I'd like to see a flag so that the Pledge of Allegiance can be said. Okay. And I, I doubt there's any objection, so. Do you have any comments to, or discussion related to that? No, sir, I do not. Well, without any objections from the board, then we'll direct Mr. Scanlon to, to <coughs> providing that. Thank you, sir. That, that's all I have. Okay, Mr. Eidlett. Mr. Scanlon did get a, a flag for us at Knott's Island, I, and I want to thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> my comments are going to be fairly brief. I just want to thank this board. I want to thank the citizens of Currituck, our staff, uh, for all the wonderful words of support, the visitations, the emails, the cards, the flowers that my wife and our family received uh, after her mom passed. It was heartfelt from everyone, and we certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Patrick. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> say 2012 is an important year in the United States of America in Currituck County. We have a right that other countries don't have. It's a right to vote. We have a right to vote for what we want and what we need, and I encourage everybody, if you're not registered to vote, please, it's your right as a United States citizen and a Currituck County resident, get out and, and register to vote. And bring your ID. And bring your ID. <laughs> Ms. Gilbert. Um, I would just like to announce that um, this Saturday, um, not only is it my birthday, but um, the Writers for a Cause is having, there's a um, support St. Jude's Children's <laughs> Research Hospital. There's a horse show and fun show at the Kurtuk 4-H Rural Center. So those of you that have not had the opportunity to go out to this facility, um, this is another opportunity for you to get out and support the 4-H um, and also the St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. The event begins at 10 a.m. and there is a rain date of January 28th. Um, those of you that do not know where that is, it is located at 184 Milburn Sawyer Road in Powell's Point. So I encourage you to go out. Um, Watch the horse show and fun show, and um, and also check out the rural center. Very good, thank you. And you're providing cake for everybody for your birthday. Sure. Right? Okay. All right. <laughs> I only have one brief comment too, and I just wanted to kind of reiterate what Mr. Eidlitz said. I really appreciate the outpouring of, of well thoughts and wishes for my my wife, who is uh, quite quite ill, but uh, battling bravely. And we really appreciate your thoughts. Uh, Mrs. Scanlon, you have any thoughts tonight? Nothing tonight, thank you. Okay, very good. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I can ask a question along with uh, Commissioner Gilbert's request. We had, I think Commissioner Martin had talked about a sign that we were working on for the Rural Center um, out, on one, uh, out on the highway. Y yes, sir. Um, he had requested that uh, we look at putting signage out on 158, and we've submitted an application to NCDOT for, they have a um, a program for, uh, tourist destinations that we put an application in for for funding and approval for having a sign installed sign installed thank you so, all right that concludes, to adjourn. That concludes the business okay all in favor aye, aye. opposed good evenings <laughs>